Hello again, and welcome to an introduction to logic. This is Unit 1, Lecture 3, An Introduction to Argument, Part 2. In Part 1 of this lecture, we explored the basic component parts of arguments. In this video, we'll expand on that definition by offering some further clarification of premises, conclusions, and inferences, as well as learning how to recognize arguments when we encounter them. We'll conclude with a brief conversation about why we bother to use arguments at all. So let's get started. In the last video, we said arguments are a linguistic expression of rational thinking, or more precisely defined, arguments are any set of two or more statements where one of those statements is logically dependent on the other. In thinking about this definition, we identified three necessary parts of any argument. The premise is the statement in an argument that provides support or evidence or a warrant for the conclusion. Conversely, the conclusion is the statement in an argument that is dependent on the premise. It's what follows from the evidence. And the inference is that logical connection that exists between the premise and the conclusion. It's what connects the two together. We concluded the last video by noting that premises and conclusions are statements, and that we needed to define just what a statement is in order to more fully understand the nature of an argument. So let's turn our attention to that. A statement is properly defined as any bivalent sentence. Now, bivalence means having two possible values, and in this case, we're talking about truth values. So, any sentence that can be assigned a truth value of true or false is a statement. By the way, for a statement to be true just means that it accurately corresponds to however the universe turns out to be not how we believe it to be, or how we would like it to be, or wish it to be, but rather how it actually is. If and how we know a statement is true or false, that's a problem for epistemology. And as we already know, that's a completely different subdiscipline of philosophy altogether. And if it turns out that we cannot know just how the world is, that doesn't change the fact that there is a way that the world is. And that's all we mean by true. So, we'll set aside all of those epistemological questions and come back to them another time. Here are some examples of simple statements. All cats are dogs. Cato's asleep on the bed. Sodium reacts with water. And I'm a physician. Notice that each of these statements can meaningfully be said to be true or false. The first statement, which happens to be a categorical statement, and we'll learn more about those in Unit 2, happens to be false. The second is most likely to be true, since my dog loves napping on the bed. Our observations from Chemistry Lab have taught us that sodium does indeed react with water, and how. And although I am a doctor, I'm not a physician, so that one's false. Statements are sentences like these that can be either true or false. However, it's important to note that while many of the sentences that we can form in our language are statements, not all of them are, there are many meaningful utterances which we can formulate in language that do not have truth value. Arguments require statements, not just coherent and meaningful sentences. Now, why this is the case will become clear in an upcoming video, so let's put a pin in that for right now and merely recognize that there are lots of different kinds of sentences that are not statements. Another term we'll be using a lot in our conversation about logic is proposition. Now, in ordinary discourse, we might use the word statement and proposition synonymously, but in logic, they have precise and distinct meanings. Consider this example. The cat is on the mat. And, le chat est sur la tapis. 
These are two different sentences from two different languages. They are different statements. However, their meaning is exactly the same. We can use two different statements to articulate the exact same proposition. This distinction allows us to step outside of the peculiarities of different languages to get at the precise meaning expressed in that language. It's why we're able to translate from one language to another. Now, what exactly the nature of meaning is, is a topic for metaphysics, so we'll set that aside for another day. But for now, we'll simply recognize that propositions are the meaningful content of statements. Now that we're clear on the difference between a statement and a proposition, we can return to make a further clarification about logical inferences. We've already discovered that inferences are the logical magic that happens between statements, transforming them into arguments. But this transformation is not always obvious. The examples that we've been using so far were all marked and made explicit by the use of certain words or phrases. They were explicit inferences. These words and phrases are very, very useful in helping us to detect the presence of an inference, but just like chemical reactions, we may not always be able to observe when they happen. What makes an inference observable is the presence of indicators that highlight which statement is the premise or the conclusion. And it's going to be important for us to pay close attention to these linguistic cues as we learn not only to recognize that a conversation or passage is an argument, but also to begin our analysis of them because we're going to have to distinguish between which statements are premises and which are conclusions. Now these are all terms and phrases that are commonly used to indicate the presence of a premise or conclusion. These lists are by no means exhaustive, but these are very, very common examples. So, as you're reading a passage, look for the presence of these words to help you identify the existence of an argument. However, a word of caution is needed, because not every supposed inference is actually an inference. This is one of the tricks that sophists can use to lead you to accept something as a conclusion when, and in fact, it is not really a conclusion at all. We'll have to learn a whole lot more about both induction and deduction to be in a position to evaluate whether an inference is valid or strong, but for our present purposes, you can look to these terms to help you not only identify the presence of an argument, but also to identify the parts of an argument, which are the premises, which are the conclusions. Unfortunately, not all arguments are going to contain indicator words. It's, of course, very polite for someone to provide us with inference indicators, but as we know, not everyone is polite. So we can have inferences that are completely unsignified. Implicit inferences will often occur in arguments, so we can't be completely dependent on the presence of indicator words and phrases in order to detect the presence of an argument. But don't worry, the more practice you get in detecting arguments, the less you'll be dependent on the presence of indicator words. They're a good rule of thumb to help you recognize that you have an argument, but they're not absolute. Now, before we go on to discuss why we use arguments in the first place, there's one really important thing we need to note about inferences. 99.9 .9 times out of 100, when we discover an inference, we're going to have an argument. Whether it's a good or bad argument is, again, a separate issue, but there will be an argument. There is, however, the exception that proves the rule. A conditional or hypothetical statement, also known as a material implication, is a case where we encounter an inference within the context of a single statement. It's a compound statement, so it's composed of two simpler parts, each of which will have a truth value, but they are joined together in a unique logical fashion, using the words if and then. We can use these words to join up statements like Cato is a dog 
and Cato is a mammal to form. If Cato is a dog, then he's a mammal. Or we could use if and then to join Cato is a mammal and Cato is an animal. Or we could use if and then to join the simple statement Cato is an animal to Cato is not a mineral. Each one of these if and then statements contains an inference from the first statement to the second, but these are not arguments. Hypothetical propositions have two distinct parts which form a really unique logical inference, which is going to be very, very useful when we get to the unit on propositional logic. But the antecedent and consequent of conditional statements have other useful things to teach us in logic, as we're about to see. But first, two more definitions to learn. The antecedent of a conditional statement is the statement that follows the word if, and the consequent is the statement that follows the word then. Now, this is really easy to remember, since the word ante means before, as in antechamber. And consequence, or consequences, are what always follow after some particular action. So, we have the before part, the antecedent, and the after part, the consequent. Now for the useful part. Let's suppose you're worried about whether or not you have COVID-19. Well, in order for you to have COVID-19, it must be the case that you've been exposed to SARS-CoV-2. You can't have COVID-19, which is the disease, if you've not been exposed to the virus, since the virus is the cause of the illness. This is what we call a necessary condition. It is a condition without which something else cannot occur. However, just because you've been exposed to the virus doesn't mean that you'll get sick. Lots of people get exposed and never get sick, though we don't really fully understand why that's the case. But it's probably much as it is with other viral infections. Being infected does not mean that you'll get sick but being sick does mean that you did get infected. So whatever those other conditions are, perhaps a weakened immune system or some other underlying set of medical conditions, which when conjoined with the infection, cause you to be sick with COVID-19, that is what we identify as a sufficient condition. Whenever a sufficient condition is met, we will have the consequent. Now for the fun part. The parts of a conditional statement demonstrate these two relationships to one another. The antecedent of a conditional statement is a sufficient condition for the consequent, and the consequent forms a necessary condition for the antecedent. Let's look at another example to visualize this more clearly. Let's take the conditional statement that if Cato is a dog, then he's a mammal. This statement is saying that being a dog is a sufficient condition for being a mammal, and also that being a mammal is a necessary condition for being a dog. A little diagram will help to make this even more clear. Here we see in the large circle the representation of all of the things that are mammals, while the smaller circle represents all things that are dogs. Since all of the dogs are within the mammal group, anything that is in that category must also be in the mammal group. Our conditional claim tells us that Cato is a dog, so that is a sufficient condition for his also being a mammal, as well as the fact that being a mammal is a necessary condition for being a dog. You couldn't be a dog unless you were also a mammal. Keeping track of which statement is a, the necessary condition and which one is the sufficient condition is really, really easy if we just think of the sun. Sufficient, then necessary. The sun always makes things clear. Sufficient first, then necessary. The antecedent is the sufficient condition. The consequent is the necessary condition. 
Now, we're going to conclude part two of our introduction to arguments by thinking very briefly about why we use arguments in the first place. As we learned in our overview of logic, the first philosophers turned to logos because they found muthos to be an unsatisfactory method of explaining the universe. They wanted an explanation of things that didn't wander off after the story was over. They wanted something stable. They wanted something rational. And that's the point. We use arguments in order to persuade people using reason, not emotion, because reason should give us an explanation that will be stable from one day to the next. The reliability of reason is the driving force behind our desire to use arguments. So what kinds of things does reason tell us to believe? Well, it turns out that there are some things that reason commands us to believe without the need for argumentation. Some statements are self-evident and require no justification as they are prima facie true. We'll explore such claims in far more detail later on, but for now, consider these examples. Cats are cats. Bachelors are unmarried men. Triangles are trilinear. Nothing is both red and black all over. Notice that in each of these cases, we would find it extremely odd for someone to ask, well, why do you believe that? In fact, failing to accept these kinds of propositions would suggest some kind of cognitive malfunction in a rational being. But most statements about the world are not self-evident. Most statements require some kind of justification or warrant. Enter the argument. Deduction offers us a method of belief justification that will, if we follow the rules correctly, yield statements with certainty. In this argument, we have two premises and a conclusion. It's technically called a syllogism, but we'll come back to that later. Unlike our conditional statement from a moment ago, here we have three distinct statements with an inference from the two premises to the conclusion. And as long as we grant that the premises are true, that is, if we assume that they are true, the conclusion will also have to be true. In fact, it's impossible for it to be false if the premises are true. So deductive proof or demonstration is one method of justifying a statement about the world. But as we've mentioned in earlier videos, we can't always use deduction. It isn't always going to apply in every field. So we also have the inductive method of reasoning. Now, while we can't achieve certainty using induction, its broad field of application makes it a very desirable method of argumentation. This is an example of generalizing induction. It will allow us to provide justification for the belief that all domestic cats are quadrupeds. Of course, we can't be certain, but given the overwhelming evidence presented, it is certainly very likely that they are. It would be reasonable for me to accept the conclusion based on the premises. One final note as we close out our overview of argumentation. We can't forget that while we strive to be guided by reason in the form of argument, we are human, and therefore we are also emotional beings. While a good argument should be persuasive in itself, we have to recognize that there are other things that we can do to bolster our success when we construct or analyze arguments. Establishing credibility with our audience can significantly bolster our success when presenting or criticizing an argument. In essence, this is an attempt to recognize the non-rational factors that might dispose an audience against an argument that we present. Doing sufficient research on the subject is absolutely critical to establishing your credibility with the audience. This allows you not only to adequately address the issues presented in your argument, 
but also to anticipate objections before they're actually raised. Addressing objections as part of the context of your own argument will demonstrate that you are presenting your argument in good faith. Which brings us to the second issue, objectivity, being free of bias, or at least being as free of bias as possible, will also help to foster receptivity on the part of your audience. The goal of reason is to direct our minds to the truth, whatever the truth turns out to be. So being objective, that is, being willing to accept the truth, is essential to the protocols of logic. So being objective, being free from bias, is going to be very useful in establishing credibility. And finally, always applying the principle of charity to opposing arguments will demonstrate your credibility to an audience. We are all too familiar with the fact that arguments can be polarizing, especially in popular discourse and certainly in politics. Oftentimes you hear it said, either you're on this side or you're on that side, and anyone that's on that side must be bad, and anybody that's on my side must be good, right? The principle of charity asks you to assume that your opponent's argument is not fallacious simply because you disagree with the position that they hold, or indeed because of the person who's making the argument. The principle of charity requires us to assume that they have good intentions in the arguments that they present. We're thus freed from the quagmire of trying to distinguish personal intention, which we can never really know for certain anyway, from the argument that we have to analyze or oppose. It allows us to focus on the argument itself and not the person presenting it. It requires us to acknowledge the limitations of the person presenting the argument and how those limitations might have impacted the effectiveness of the argument that they presented. The principle of charity, in effect, insulates us from personalizing what should be an objective affair guided solely by the rules of reason as we discover, or seek to discover, the truth. Now, let's summarize what we've covered in this second part of our lecture on arguments. We've discovered that an argument is a set of at least two statements where one is logically dependent on the other. We've learned that there are three necessary elements to every argument, at least one premise, at least one conclusion, and an inference tying the two together. We've also learned that the premises and conclusions of arguments must be in the form of statements, that is, sentences that have a truth value. And we've also learned that propositions are the meaningful content of those statements, which allows us to step back from the ambiguities and particularities of individual languages and to think more objectively about the nature of arguments. Finally, we've seen that the purpose of using arguments is to persuade, whether it's ourselves or our audience, using reason alone. Our goal is to seek the truth, to discover however the world turns out to be independent of how we might want the world to be. This makes clear why logic is not just debate. The goal in debate is to win, to defeat your opponent. The goal in logic is to learn and apply the rules of reason in order to establish, as well as we possibly can, the way the universe is. In our next video, we'll continue our investigation into logic by examining in more detail the differences between formal and informal logic. We'll look more closely at what makes an argument inductive or deductive, and what happens when we fail to follow the rules of argumentation. So join us again next time as we learn a little bit of logic.